Bastion, Carestia the Archon, Guide of the Dead. Carest designs here, Carestia the Firstborn. Instead of the headdress, Carestia will have a halo behind her, a disc of pure silver with the Kyrian symbol emblazoned upon it. It is the most ornate thing about her. The rest of her garb is actually very simple and is less ornate than those of the typical Ascended. In truth, she looks more like an aspirant that has wings. Only the halo and her eyes, the purest of silver, belie her true nature. She sometimes wields her cannon spear, the spear of Bastion, to bring truth to light. Her other form, Carestia the True. At some point in the expansion, after the Devos fiasco, Carestia begins to recover from her apathy. This leads to her assuming a truer form, one that denotes her nature as the goddess of truth. She wears heavy armor in this form, looking akin to the ideal concept of a paladin. Instead of her spear, she brings to bear her true weapon, Guardian, Bastion of the Shadowlands, which was previously the halo floating behind her. A mirror of purest silver, it reflects only truth. Dude, that is so fucking sick. Oh man, unlike her previous form, we see the true nature of Carestia's wings. They unfurl and reveal that she has six of them, as a nod to the concept of the Seraphim. <laughs> like Tyrael. Instead... <laughs> it's not... terrible. It's not terrible. But... It's not, it's not great. Her shield being made of like silver that reflects the truth, that's insane. And you're gonna see, it actually gets used later in like an interesting, an interesting like story way. Trust me, <laughs> it's, let this build bro. Just let your, let your imagination wander. Don't, don't bind yourself too strictly to what is in the game and just think about what could be in the game. That's what I ask. Just let me paint this picture for you. I'm the voice. Lumino's got all the words here. So let us let us do this here. <laughs> the role of the Archon again will be greatly increased. Uh, <clears throat> by this point, we'll have already seen or heard about, sorry, we'll have already heard about all the Covenant leaders, ideally with some kind of mosaic or mural to show them as grandiose and divine, perfect and without flaw. When you get to Bastion, the first NPC we will meet is Pelagos, who will explain the basic gist of the Shadowlands from the Kyrian perspective and establish his character. The second character we meet is Carestia. Pelagos almost slips up and calls her Archon, but she dismisses it and reminds him that they have duties to attend to. At this point in the story, we don't know that the Archon is named Carestia, so she's just a random ascended Kyrian to us that happens to have a silver halo. She's presented as a typical, if apathetic, ascended Kyrian, although she is sometimes referred to as Carestia Firstborn. The story of Bastion begins to play out, except we have a trio instead of a duo for characters. Pelagos represents the young but inexperienced, Clea, the knowledgeable yet anxious, and Carestia, the wise yet jaded. She easily knows the most of the three of them, but she's very apathetic about most things that don't involve their duties. Despite this, Pelagos and Clea show her absolute respect and never seem to doubt her. During the attack on the Temple of Purity by the Forsworn, the truth about the Kyrians and their memory purging is revealed. Carestia states that it is necessary. Without this sacrifice, she states, they could not perform their duties. Without this sacrifice, she states, they could not perform their duties. They can only see the truth with eyes unclouded by biases and perceptions. She sees the Forsworn and marks them as fallen, before discerning their true motives. She departs for the Temple of Courage, but first tells Pelagos that so long as he remains true, he will find what he seeks. Carestia will be absent until the group arrives at the Temple of Courage, <laughs> where they discover that the wards have held and that Uther has been captured. Is this correct here? Where they discover that the wards have held and that Uther has been captured. 
That's right. Just making sure. That's right. Okay. The day's doorway. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. They didn't fall because the diversion failed. Right. Okay, okay. Karesti will be absent until the group arrives at the Temple of Courage, where they discover that the wards have held and that Uther has been captured. He questions if she will peer into his heart, but she reveals that she already knows the hearts of both he and his paragon. Uther is shaken by this, as Karesti requests the group travel to the Spires of Ascension, where doubt will soon fall. Pelagos, Clea, and the player all depart for the Spires of Ascension with the Paragons, while Carestia remains with Uther. Pelagos questions if she will be alright, but Polemark Adrestes... I don't know if I say that right. I think I do. Polemark Adrestes chides him and states to have faith in her, with capital H, denoting that she is of a higher station. Subtle hinting in the story. I like what he's done here, where Carestia starts off as like, you don't you don't know who she is, right? She's not a... What, one of the things that I didn't like about Bastion, and I don't know how you guys felt about this, it's kind of lame to me that the way that they treat getting a, an audience with the Archon is really fucking annoying. And by that I mean the grandiest temples floating in the sky that you have to like do all this work to like get to or learn anything about. I just think it was kind of lame. I didn't like that. I like the concept of the bearers of souls, like Carestia, to be like walking among the denizens of Bastion and like partaking in things and not just like sitting up on high, looking down at, so I like what you've done here. It was at this point that the deliciousness of the raspberry and rhubarb pie you see Pyro eating was such that it caused him and Chat to spiral into a 20 minute long discussion about fresh fruit and pastries. I have removed this discourse for your convenience. It's not much, but it's honest work. It just opens the door to everything. Cobbler, mm, donuts are in there now too. Oh shit, oh shit, this is fucked up. We gotta go, listen, we gotta get back to this. Back to this. Okay, here we go. Carestia sees the Forsworn and marks them as fallen before discerning their true motives. <laughs> she departs for the Temple of Courage, but first tells Pelagos that so long as he remains true. Keep this line in mind because it's fucking relevant. Carestia departs for the Temple of Courage, but first tells Pelagos that so long as he remains true, he will find what he seeks. Carestia will be absent until the group arrives at the Temple of Courage, where they discover that the wards have held and that Uther has been captured. He questions if she will peer into his heart, but she reveals that she already knows the hearts of both he and his paragon. Uther is shaken by this as Carestia requests the group travel to the Spires of Ascension, where doubt will soon fall. Pelagos, Clea, and the player all depart for the Spires of Ascension, while the paragons... with the paragons, while Carestia remains with Uther. Pelagos questions if she will be all right, but Polemark Adrestes chides him and states to have faith in her. The cinematic for Bastion then plays, with Uther questioning why she forces them to sacrifice their memories. Carestia ignores him while she picks up a nearby bell. He then asks why she allowed their plans to play out. Why allow his paragon to... Carestia cuts him off and says that one's actions, not one's thoughts, reveal their truth. She then ascends with the bell leaving Uther behind. Stormy clouds begin to roll in from the west as Carestia reaches her zenith. The clouds take on greenish hues, as if alight with lightning. Carestia holds the bell before letting it go, and it begins to float in front of her. She holds her hands aloft, as if grasping her halo behind her, and it begins to illuminate as if it were a second sun. Carestia begins to shine brightly, as her wings unfurl to reveal a total of six. The light illuminates the storm and reveals that it is actually a Maldraxxi necropolis. The Maldraxxi attempt to attack upon being revealed, but their attacks fail upon the wards. Carestia, revealed as the Archon, states that treachery has no place in Bastion. The bell in front of her begins to ring, and as its ring echoes, Maldraxxi crystals begin to crack. 
and then shatter in the resonance. The necropolis then falls away into the nothing below, as Carestia turns towards the darkening spires with a solemn expression. The events of the Spires of Ascension then play out as the first Shadowlands dungeon. There is a change to the visuals of the dungeon in that the Spires of Ascension are not floating temples, but instead a series of shrines upon a great mountain. At the peak of the mountain is a grand monastery, which Kyrian aspirants must reach, must reach as their final test in becoming ascended. The Paragons move to fight Devos while the group goes through the dungeon, clearing the bosses as per canon. Polemarch Adrestes and some of the other ascended aid Pelagos, Clea, and the players in making it to the peak. By the time they reach Devos, however, she has already corrupted the Spear of Bastion with Maw energy, which she uses to crush the other paragons. The sky around the spires grows dark during this encounter, almost like being in the Maw. The fight then plays out very differently. Devos appears as a Maw-sworn Kyrian, without the helmet, with an extremely high amount of health, akin to an Odin or Helia encounter. Partway through the fight, she utilizes illusory copies to instill vision, instill, instill doubt on the players. After the illusions are broken, the sound of a bell rings out. Devos's appearance is returned to that of her normal Kyrian self, and her health is reduced to a reasonable amount for a dungeon boss, at about 25%. She is brought to about 10% health and is then defeated. As Devos falls, Carestia appears before them as light returns to the spires. She heals the paragons and resurrects any dead players, then thanks them for their service in the fall of doubt. The dungeon then ends. The quest following the dungeon involves Carestia banishing Devos to Oribos, stating that treachery has no place in Bastion. She then offers ascension to both Clea and Pelagos, which, is, which Clea eagerly accepts, and Pelagos declines. He explains that he's still looking for the path that is true to him, and Carestia gives him a gentle smile and nod. Clea becomes an ascended Kyrian. Carestia then tells them about the failed attack on the Temple of Courage, and that Maldraxxus was behind it. This shocks everyone, and angers the Paragons with Xandria even offering to lead a counterattack, Carestia gently brings everyone to silence before proclaiming that Bastion has its own burdens to mend, and reminds them of the Forsworn still being out there. She beckons Uther as an example. The Paragons accept her wisdom, and they return to their own temples to begin reconstruction and or preparation. When the player goes to interact with the Archon, she explains that she cannot fight a war on two fronts and intends to deal with the Forsworn before providing aid to the rest of the Shadowlands. She bestows a Kyrian sigil upon them, a blessing that will allow them to traverse the other realms of the Shadowlands, and cautions them to remember to judge by actions, not by words. The player then departs, begins to depart, but Pelagos asks Carestia if he can go with them on their journey. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. On their journey. She begins by stating that there are many duties to attend to in Bastion, but that is for the Ascended to worry about. He has given her blessing to depart as part of his path, and a single feather of hers. The two then depart on their own paths. There is then a stay a while and listen dialogue with Carestia and Uther, who questions why she has kept him in Bastion while sending Devos away. Carestia replies that it is simple. Uther was never loyal or false to her while Devos was her paragon of loyalty. He considers this for a moment, but before solemnly stating that he too knows the sting of betrayal, and Carestia says that she has much to consider on the matter. Maldraxxus. Before we go there, I, I like this a lot. I like how it's more aligned with the concept of truth, of ascension through a personal journey, I like how you have the, have the mix-in, obviously, of her kind of being apathetic and believing that the, uh, the, the severance of memories is necessary. And how um, you're kind of already hinting, you know, with the, the nature of change. How uh, she's, she has much to ponder at this point. 
Devos, her sworn loyalist, is the one who betrayed her. And choosing not to just kill her, I think, is an interesting choice. I like what you do with the mountain, with the final journey, like the final pilgrimage. I think that's very fucking thematically fitting. And I like the, uh... I mean, there's just so many little subtle hints that you've done in here that foreshadow. And I don't, I don't want to talk about them too much, because... <laughs> We're gonna get to them. Uh, I don't know, it's really good. Didn't act upon them because Devos didn't do anything. She knew that Devos had these doubts, but didn't act upon them. Because Devos didn't do anything. She seems like she knows better without being obnoxious and blind. Right. Carestia, as we have her in the game, is like kind of arrogant. And like, out of touch it seems. Judge by actions, not by words or thoughts. Right. Let's move to Maldraxxus here. And, and also, what's being established here, Chad, is an MC, right? Someone to go along with us through the Shadowlands. Instead of us each aligning ourselves with a, a segmented story for our, for our uh, covenants, that's not happening here. Instead, what, what Lumino has done is he's put together a story that, uh, this is from someone in my chat, Lumino. He's one of my mods, longtime friend of mine as well. Um, and, uh, so what he's done is he's taken, he's given us a story that includes all of the covenants and all these things while just being your character. And while you can get the extra benefits and stuff of, like, the covenant system in, in ways, what he's done is he hasn't fragmented this story and put it behind four separate characters, four separate things, you know? Um, so I think that's really good. It's, it's better than dividing it all up. And it probably makes for a fucking better alt experience, let's be honest. When you don't have to, like, have all this extra shit. So what it, what's happening with Pelagos is you guys know that Pelagos, by the end of the expansion, turns into the Arbiter. And some people would say that they feel like that wasn't necessarily, like, fully earned through story quite the way it should have been. I And I would probably say that. I like Pelagos. But what's going to happen here is Pelagos is going to go on a journey with us. And through witnessing what we're doing, he's going to gain certain wisdoms and learn certain things, which will build this thematic thing that will better lead to him becoming the Arbiter instead of it feeling kind of disjointed, and especially if you weren't with the Bastion uh, Covenant, where Pelagos kind of becomes the Arbiter, and we're like, oh. Uh, oh. I feel like the themes of these zones were not handled very well. Compared to what I'm reading here, the themes of the zones as we got them is very bland. It's so watered down, it feels like. They're very generic. Very safe, I would almost say. Very safe. And I don't think that that's what they probably originally wanted for the Shadowlands. And I think uh, that with as we get into Maldraxxus and as we get into Revendreth, you're going to hear some, thematical, some thematic stuff that, in my opinion, is way better than what we got. And what Lumino allows for here is the transition from one state to another. Our presence in the Shadowlands brings about a nature of change. Things are happening while we're there. And what he's focused on here with each of these Eternals, or, or Kythan or Kithan, whichever, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but with each, with, each, with each of them, they're going from one state to another. Whether it be apathetic to truly girded to stand for truth and justice and those things again, you know, and not have to give up your memories and all that stuff, which we will come to eventually, I think. Or obviously that gets resolved in the game, so this is kind of, you know, filling in the gaps of, in, in, in sorts of ways, right? So I just think that, like, thematically, it's superior. I remember Shadowlands' announcement and all the speculations, excitement, theories we were talking about. I know it was crazy. Shadowlands also went through some pretty serious dev hell, didn't it? Or am I thinking of a different, different X-Pack? So let me clarify something. Yeah, it did, yes, it did. But I'm also... I also want to... To, to say that, like, 
I'm not disregarding that, but we're also not gonna like, I'm not blaming, I'm not like really putting blame on them, you know? I'm not trying to like, oh fucking, I'm just, I guess what this really is, is an example of like, with a little bit more inspiration, a little bit more thematic inspiration going on here, it maybe could have been just more streamlined and something that hit harder in each zone. And things that are more properly linked to the concept of death, acceptance, suffering, all of those things that Shadowlands tries to tackle, but just not in necessarily the most in interesting or like colorful way. Like it's cool to have really like starkly themed things. And as we go into these next two, you're gonna, there's a reason that they've been, we still have Ardenweald as well. You guys haven't even heard. There's just, uh, let's continue here. We're not even halfway. Huh. Let's see. The Primus, protector of the dead. Designs, the rune carver. Instead of the weird mask thing they had, we're gonna have him be a hooded old man. They are, there are not going to be physical chains holding him, but a circle of runes that he has bound inside, similar to what happens to Anduin in the actual story. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <coughs> a hooded old decrepit man, bound inside of a circle of runes. I like that better actually too, because it implies that perhaps though inside those runes, Maybe there could be a something going on, you know? The best point of comparison I could draw is how Iroh looks to the guards while he's imprisoned in Avatar. Except this guy is actually just kind of crazy. <laughs> the rune carver, that is. Iroh imprisoned. I'm not gonna pull it up, I'll get fucking copyrighted and they'll fucking censor my stream on YouTube. The hooded old frail man's always a good rug pull. Right, right. The Primus. Largely unchanged from the canon design, except we're replacing his horns with a pointed hat. The goal is to make him evoke the imagery of characters like Odin or Gandalf. To follow that point, we're also going to change his staff into a spear, the name of which is Leviathan. Leviathan. I don't know how you want me to say that, but it's a play on Leviathan, I'm pretty sure. The Commander of the Shadowlands is what it's called. Leviathan, Leviathan, the Commander of the Shadowlands. How do you want me to say this? How's that word said? Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's in, and these are, these names for things are drawing inspiration from other things. Like, yeah, it's a weapon from Norse mythology, right. Anyway, this is his weapon, the Commander of the Shadowlands. The Pilgrim, the final form, the other form. Stripped of his role and title, and given what was essentially Zoval's job, the not Primus, now Pilgrim, is left to watch over and guide the souls of the lost back to the Arbiter. His garb has taken on an ashy hue, and any finery he may have possessed is gone. Levitain's head has been blunted, and hanging from the spear is a lantern, used to guide and comfort souls in the darkness. This is like the most Dark Soul shit I've ever heard. <laughs> this garb now has an ashy hue, his finery is all gone. The head of his spear is blunted and hanging from it is a lantern used to guide and comfort souls in the darkness. Backstory slash plot. This is gonna be the merging of the default and theory versions of this storyline, with the Primus being ultimately at fault for what's going on. He's never actually antagonistic to the players and remains entirely cordial to add to the ambiguity of it. His domain is protection, and as such he will do whatever it takes to see the Shadowlands protected, even if it means taking extreme measures and hurting the ones that he's meant to protect. He remains true to his nature throughout the story, and although he's fearful at times, he's always willing to do whatever it takes. Usually that leads to bad things happening in the name of the greater good. That sounds like Eonar. Lamau. Even so, he's not wholly evil, and he does genuinely want to protect his charges. He doesn't ever really express hatred for anyone, and is overall accepting, 
There are scenes to balance out the good with the bad, while ultimately having him as the anti-villain that set things into motion. The Primus was in imprisoned by Zoval around the time that all of the undead on Azeroth started going to the Maw. Their presence allowed Zoval to slowly break free of the domination placed upon him. I like that, dude. The will of the Forsaken. Literally changing the Maw and thus providing Zoval with the willpower to start to break free from domination. That's fucking Gigabrain, dude. That's fucking, that's guess Gigabrain. Unable to use domination on him again. Uh, unable to use domination on him again. The Primus was surprised and imprisoned within Torghast. See, this is so much better, dude. This is so much better. Like, the Primus puppeteering the Jailer, or not really puppeteering him, but you, you know, I guess in this way, using domination on him to basically suppress his will and to break him. It's like him being influenced by the influx of Forsaken and their willpower altering his mental state such so that he could start to break free from it. That's also sick as fuck because later on when the Primus is like trying to figure out how the willpower of, of mankind is able to like break through domination is like makes way more sense because he's trying to understand the nature of what the wills allowed them to do. Then you have an actual plot with that, where it's like, it's illustrating further that the, their willpower is what breaks them out of domination. You know? And that's just like not illustrated well enough at all. Right, it ends up feeling like MacGuffin Azeroth at the end with her fucking mega power is the only reason, right? Where Anduin is like an example of that not being true. <laughs> So, they didn't do a good job of doing that. And I think that this is, this is nice, man. The way that, like, you, you, you're, you're working in, like, how, how he started to break free. Because, and I like that this, you do this kind of hybrid story, like what you said, between canon and non-canon. Because in non-canon, none of this shit's fuck or in canon, none of this shit's fucking explained. You know? How the, how the, what really happened is of all. How did fucking, how did, uh, um, how did the Primus get captured? Why was, captured, right? Why was he even in there? How did Zoval break free from that? Why is Zoval still bent on doing a bad thing? It's because, like you said, domination basically broke him to a degree, and his, his, his idea of equality, like you said, is bound in the concept of suffering equally. Like, this, this is a great injustice that has been done, thanks to life's influence. Shocker. <laughs> and, as a result, I'm going to fix it. You know? What did he do? Do we even know? No. They don't say. They never actually tell us what he was, presumably, I guess maybe what they imply is that what he was going to do is he was going to use Zareth Mortis to rewrite reality, right? I mean, that's kind of like the only impl implied thing, I think, right? That he was going to do that, and so they imprison him for it. But why would they even know about Zareth Mortis? Doesn't that imply that they knew about it too? And maybe the reason why he decided he was going to do it is from the fact that they got into knowledge they were not supposed to fuck with. Does that make sense? The way that the Primus ends up basically displaying that he can do first one's magic and shit. It's like, whoa, <laughs> what the fuck? Kind of like bringing that together would have been really nice, but they didn't do any of that. They didn't do any of that. It's like the expansion is missing its actual core twist and storyline. It just ends up being a generic, like, the, the, the expansion unironically, due to like what was happening there, suffered from like creative death and like they basically just it turned into like literal just suffering <laughs> i mean that's all it that's all it was i don't, I don't know I, I definitely think i mean and, and and i guess maybe in this way the game became a reflection of what was happening at the company what was happening with those people right art imitates life art imitates reality and if you're if your reality is that of stress and crunching and, you know, unreasonable pay and long hours and terrible work, uh, you know, 
atmosphere and people doing sexual harassment and crazy shit around other people and feeling like you can't say anything about it and if you do then you might get fucking fired or retaliatory action or something and like oh you know it's like when you're working in a place like that you know even if it's intended or not you know the game's gonna suffer that's the way i feel about it if the people making a product are miserable i feel like that product is not going to be as good that's true with everything it's true with music it's true with a lot of shit well, music sometimes suffering makes really good music, but that's a different kind of thing. That's that's a different expression. You know what I'm trying to say. So, this is just, yeah, I can see the Dark Souls inspiration. I can see the Diablo inspiration. And honestly, some of this stuff I feel like would have hit better with, like, maybe that player base that wants something a little more gritty. And we're not even to that part yet. <laughs> So, the Primus was imprisoned by Zoval around the time that all the undead on Azeroth started going to the Maw. Their presence allowed Zoval to slowly break free of the domination placed upon him, and he then turned on the Primus. Unable to use domination magic on him again, the Primus was surprised and imprisoned within Torghast. The Jailer attempted to dominate him in vengeance, but it ultimately failed as his nature of protection was never broken. So, and I like what you've done here, because you're reinforcing the idea that the reason why the Jailer was able to be dominated was because his innate nature of protection was never taken advantage of. So the way in which Zoval kind of had this kind of like internal break at the, at the kind of perceived, um, uh, inequality of what happened with this soul that came to the Shadowlands, it is what allowed him, as you stated, to be vulnerable to domination. And so in this way, I think it's interesting that you've, that you're have that you doubling down on this. The Jailer attempted to dominate him in vengeance, but ultimately it failed, as his nature of protection was never broken. So domination will only work on someone, like you said, who has been tormented and suffering and the crack in kind of their their being is then exploited. Which I think is way fucking better. Instead of just flat fucking mind control, I think this is way fucking cooler. Because then, it, then again, what you're illustrating is that it is a process. This is not some instantaneous mega power that the Jailer just inexplicably fucking has because, because of what happened to him. You know, you've got to set the rules, right? That didn't stop him from trying and torturing him. However... As he had made a deal with Devos to deliver mirrors of Bastion, known as the Nemos, which the Jailer used to extract his memories, the source of the Rune Carver memories, and this is way better too. You're 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 bringing Devos's pact with the Jailer in to bring the these the, the memory extraction mirrors from Bastion. You're like using the things that were established in the world to explain how the Jailer was able to get these mechanisms through which he would extract memories. I think what they did in the game is that they more so wanted to illustrate perhaps that the Jailer has memory magic. It is said by the Primus when he shrouds, I think, the final sigil or whatever. I can't remember what he was doing. That he would shroud it with magic that he knew that Zoval would never be able to have, be able to fuck with. And, and we literally watch him use, like, first one's magic and... It is, if I'm not mistaken, having played through it, I think at the time, the perception was he had shrouded it within memory. And that he can use memory magic. Which is, uh, the Primus is kind of OP, to be honest. The Primus has rune carving. He's got memory magic. He's got domination. Like, he's kind of OP. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Logic's magical, isn't it? This left the Primus between states of mania and lucidity. Although he never broke. He is one of the only prisoners in Torghast that the Jailer personally and constantly oversaw the torture of. Unlike the other Kaithan, the Primus doesn't actually appear within his realm as he's missing and actually imprisoned within Torghast. That being said, Echoes of him do appear. 
He has several simulacra set up in case of emergency, each in the form of previous margraves. Through these simulacra, he attempts to teach and instill his lessons of might, courage, cunning, mastery, and endurance into those who would follow his path. OP yet got changed, sus chained, sus as hell, true. Okay. Entering into this realm of war, Pelagos and the player meet with Margrave Crexus as ambassadors from Bastion. Crexus is, in, is incensed that the House of Constructs and Rituals would be, houses of constructs and rituals would betray the purpose of their Kythan and sends them to the House of Eyes in order to discover how deep this corruption runs. I'm talking about the attack on Bastion. While there, they meet with Margrave Akarak, who is sending Baroness Draka away on a mission to the House of the Chosen. The two plan to reveal what happened in Bastion to the Margrave, but he already knows. Margraves Garmal and Sindane have betrayed Maldraxxus and the Kythan and pledged themselves to darker powers. He also reveals that there are other traitors within the Houses of Chosen and Eyes, but they have eluded his gaze. Pelagos muses that if only Carestia were here, she could determine them false and hold something in his pocket, considering the feather that Carestia gave him. To which the Margrave replies that if the gods were here, there would be no rebellion. I like what what he does here. With with these this insight from the Margrave, Akarek, calling the Eternal Ones the gods, the way that they place them as like divinities of their realms is way more interesting in my opinion. The way that the denizens of the Shadowlands see them should be as divinities, as like their gods. And I think that uh, positioning it that way is is way more interesting. It hits the general note of eternal beings as well, I think much greater than what they do with the term the eternal ones. Margrave Akarek then reveals another piece of information that before he vanished, the Primus entrusted each Margrave with a, with a relic and a trial that Sorry, and a trial they required before bestowing it. When all the relics were gathered at the seat of the Primus, his blessing would be bestowed upon the Seeker. Although war is inevitable, the Margrave believes that this blessing would be able to break the stalemate of the Loyalists and the Rebels. If they wish to aid in stopping the Rebellion then, the Margrave states, they will need to partake in the trials. Pelagos is initially caught in a moment of laughter, realizing that he left trials in Bastion for trials in Maldraxxus, but accepts stating that but accepts, stating that he would be interested to learn more about the Primus and the realm. The Margrave then permits them to undertake the trial of cunning, where they need to unmask a person holding his relic. In order to find his relic, they need to hunt down the holder, so the duo roam Maldraxxus and set a trap for its holder. The person holding this relic turns out to be Baroness Vash, who the player may or may not have killed. They get some different dialogue, depending, but they receive the relic, a rune blade inscribed with a marking, the eyes of the Primus. Margrave Akarek congratulates them for their victory, but warns that the other tests will not be easy, with Vash remarking that she allowed herself to be captured, as to uh, expedite the process. Under his orders, Vash then reveals that they already managed to recover the breath of the Primus from the ruined House of Plagues, but that they will be keeping it separate from the Rune Blade in case its holder was captured. They had been, or they will be, yeah, yeah. The breath of the Primus. I like breath of the Primus being related to plagues as well, especially considering how, like, Yasharaj breathed out and apparently, like, plagued the land. The next two trials will involve stealth. So the Margrave orders Vash to oversee and guide the two. She is initially reluctant, but accepts it as her Margrave's orders, and the now trio depart for the House of Constructs and Rituals. The two trials here are the Trial of Might and the Trial of Mastery, and are completed in either order. In order to get the trio into the houses, Vash utilizes illus illusory magics in order to mask their forms. 
The Trial of Might involves the defeating of 100 enemies by a group no larger than five. This is very reminiscent of the Cargath thing. This trial goes fine until the end is reached, when one of the individuals faced is an old and broken construct that can barely even walk. After it is defeated by taking a single hit, Pelagos questions if they've finished the trial. The trial giver determines that they must finish their final enemy before the trial is complete. Pelagos is conflicted about killing the poor creature, while Vash just wants it to be done and over with. The player is given a choice, and either they or Vash kills the construct. Confused and distraught by killing what is essentially a defenseless creature, Vash replies that the only way to prevent a threat is to rip it out, root and all. They receive the fist of the Primus. <sighs> yeah, these are nice subtle allusions to, uh, to Amon Thule, I almost feel like. Rip it out, root and all. Fist of the Primus. Breath of the Primus. Very fractally what he's done here. <laughs> it's very, very clever. He's kind of baked in some little fractals for me, and I think that's fucking sick. Completing the Trial of Mastery involves an understanding of the individual, and how that can be used to serve one's purpose. This trial bears suspicious similarities to Domination, as it involves using and abusing the weakness of a target. The goal is in taking an individual and mastering them, at the end of the trial, the player is given a choice whether to go through with mastering the individual or not. And if they don't, then Vash will go through with it in their place, citing it as necessary, while Pelagos argues that maybe there was another way. <laughs> ah, these subtle little wisdoms that Pelagos kind of throws in there that he's kind of recognizing. Hmm. Maybe there was a different way. And this is, oh, it's such a good allusion to fucking Denathrius. We could have sought another way, brother. Imagine what we could have accomplished together. Hm. If they do go through with it, Vash compliments the player on completing the task. Pelagos, meanwhile, is perturbed and questions if what they did is right, while Vash comments that such a luxury is reserved for those without a war to fight. <laughs> that militant mindset. They receive the rune of the Primus. While within the House of Rituals, Vash notes that she senses the presence of illus- illu I always say illusory. I can never say the word illusion. I don't know why. Vash notes that she senses the presence of illusion magic. That is not her own. After these trials are completed, we have a cinematic- We have the cinematic for Maldraxxus. We get to see the downfall of the House of Eyes in real time as Kel'Thuzad unmasks himself as the true leader of the House of Rituals. The real Sindane has been imprisoned within her phylactery this whole time, while Kel'Thuzad has been glamoured into her, which means he's using an illusion to look like her. There's a brief fight between the two where Margrave Akarek attempts to trap Kel'Thuzad in shadows, which works, until he unleashes Maw-touched ice, which freezes the webs and binds the spider. He then claims the rune blade containing the breath of the Primus, and uses it to kill Margrave Akarek. Before he dies, the Margrave comments that there, that many are the webs woven, and that he should be careful, lest he becomes trapped within them. Kel'Thuzad laughs, and states that his webs have all shattered, as he touches the frozen webs, and they break into frost. The rune blade glints a faint green as Akarek dies, which suggests that Akarek is taken into it which means he doesn't actually really die either, not fully anyway. And Kel'Thuzad returns to being glamoured as Sindane, and departs. Discovering that the House of Eyes has been attacked and broken, the remnants have fled into the corners of Maldraxxus. Vash is initially furious, but calms herself and reminds them that they have one more trial to complete. Attempting to apologize and sympathize with Vash, Pelagos is rebuffed and told that sympathy is for the living. The dead have no need of it. He questions the validity of that statement, but resolves to see these trials to their end. Yeah, I like that a lot. Attempting to, to apologize and sympathize with Vash, Pelagos is rebuffed and told that sympathy is for the living. The dead have no need of it. He questions the validity of that statement, but resolves to see these trials to their end. 
Arriving at the House of the Chosen, they find that it is a battlefield. The Baron Viraz has attempted a coup against Margrave Crexus, but he is ultimately foiled through the efforts of the group and Baroness Draca, who manages to save the Margrave. So in this timeline, Crexus lives. Let's fucking go, baby. In this timeline, Margrave Crexus fucking lives, dude. Let's go. He's thankful for their efforts, but shocked to hear the fate of the House of Eyes and of Margrave Akarek. Baroness Draca is lost at this, but Vash forces her to pull herself together. Wishing to aid them in their task, Margrave Crexus sadly informs them that Viraz stole their relic, the heart of the Primus. When at the heart. <laughs> when asked about the trial, he explains that they already completed it by demonstrating their courage, and that is how Viraz was allowed to steal it away. Pelagos happily notes that this trial, at least, was one of virtue. This trial, at least, was one of virtue. So in his heart, there's still some virtue. Damn. And he, it's, it's, it's suggestive of the Primus, of course, right? It's the heart of the Primus. Bash stares at him for a long moment before muttering something under her breath. Margrave Crexus reveals that there is one opportunity to recover the missing relic. There is a festival occurring within the heart of Maldraxxus, in the Theater of Pain. All of the Margraves and their barons will be there, and he knows that Viraz won't miss this opportunity to try and kill him. It will be a risk, but he's willing to take it, to see the rebellion crushed, and for the memory of lost Akarak. The dungeon then plays out, but instead of Mordetha being the final boss, the final boss will be Baron Viraz, which is how it probably should have been, who has been given both rune blades by Kel'Thuzad. He attempts to kill Margrave Crexus, but is again stopped, this time by Baroness Draca and Vash working together. He is then fought- yeah, it's Radon's festival, <laughs> yep. He is then fought and the presence of all five relics causes necromantic energy to spill forth in the arena, with the five runes of each providing a different bonus or penalty depending on who has activated them. Throughout the fight, Viraz will summon adds who will attempt to activate the runes, but if they've been slain, the players will be able to utilize the runes for its positive effects. I like that too, this duality of runes, the positive nature of it and the, and the negative nature. By the end of the fight, Viraz is dead. The rune blades have been claimed, but Margrave Sindane, actually the glamoured Kel'Thuzad, questions why these outsiders should be allowed such a relic. Remembering the feather that Carestia bestowed upon him, Pelagos holds it aloft and it shines a bright light. The gloom of Maldraxxus is broken for a moment, as the feather shines like a stray beam of sunlight. As the light fades, the glamour on Kel'Thuzad is revealed to have shattered before the Archon's gaze. Noticing that his plans have been foiled for the moment, Kel'Thuzad curses the spider and his cleverness before teleporting away. Abandoned by their ally, Margrave Garmal has no choice but to surrender or die. And I like this, this part a lot, I enjoy, because it's continuity between the storylines of the zones, right? Carestia sees within Pelagos something, she gives him this feather, which is then used to expose Kel'Thuzad's Kel deception. To the whole of Maldraxxus. I like this way better. Instead of putting it all behind, you know, things like the uh, Covenant storylines. With the relic secured, Viraz dead, Margrave Garmal defeated, and Kel'Thuzad unmasked, the rebellion has been crushed. Any remaining servants of the enemy will have to work in the shadows now, as opposed to an open war. Victory is declared to the Loyalists, and the rebels have been defeated. Margrave Crexus congratulates and thanks the four of them for their service. Although the Primus is gone, Crexus still has the authority to raise a Margrave in times of crisis, and covers both Baroness Vash, offers Baroness Vash, and Draka the role, believing them both to be worthy heirs to Akarek in different ways. The two become the Margraves of the Eyes, becoming the left and right eyes of the Primus, respectively. Which, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty fucking sick, dude. The House of Eyes leader falls, and Draca and Vash get a dual, like a joint leadership role, each being an eye of the House of Eyes, 
the eyes of the Primus. Like, dude, that is fucking sick. That's fucking sick. All then depart to the seat of the Primus where the three Margraves, Pelagos, and the player enter. An echo of the actual Primus appears before them, congratulating them on their victory. He muses if they understand the true nature of the trials, and of what and of doing what needs to be done. Vash gives a look to Pelagos again, and the player, if they refused both trials, as he shifts uncomfortably. The echo then bestows his blessings on them, one of knowledge and one of power. <laughs> the echo then bestows his blessing on them, one of knowledge and one of power. The blessing of knowledge is shared with all present, and it is about the truth of this conflict. The Primus shares knowledge of the Jailer, an ancient deity who once sought to bring ruin to the Shadowlands. Long ago, he imprisoned him within the Maw. But he has since turned his chains into weapons. If you are hearing this message, then the Primus is lost. The Archon, the Winter Queen, the Redeemer, and the Arbiter must be warned. The ancient covenants must be fulfilled once more. Which suggests that there used to be the ancient covenants must be fulfilled once more. Which means for a long time they haven't. And in this way, the Primus kind of predicted, right? So I love, again, the way that the Primus is kind of like at fault for some of this stuff, but he was trying to just do his job. I like that. Meanwhile, the blessing of power can only be bestowed upon one. It is the power to walk the rift and will allow the one bestowed to resist the influence of the Maw. Subtle little hints there. Since the player is already possessed of this ability, this blessing is given to Pelagos, should he ever find it required. During these tests, Pelagos is initially wowed by the glory of another Kythan, since Carestia was so different from him. But this gilding slowly begins to wear away as they progress the trials. The Primus was strong beyond equal, but ruthless in his pursuit of his duty. He would do what was required, no matter the cost, to ensure that the Shadowlands were safe. At the end of these trials, Pelagos decides that greatness and goodness are not the same thing.